Welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast with your host, Sean Flynn, who interviews famous entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and leaders in tech. Learn their secrets and see tomorrow's world today. Elizabeth, thank you for taking the time today to be on the Silicon Valley Podcast. Now, I'm super excited. We're here live at the Sapien Impact Hub in Menlo Park. And I'm really excited for this event. I want to thank uh, Catherine who made the introduction that allowed this interview to happen, but I've done a lot of research on your background. It's incredible. But for our audience, for the, our listeners, could you give us a little bit of background of your career up until this point? Sure. Thanks, Sean. Uh, my career has been what I would call a zigzag. Uh, I started out, I graduated from Stanford undergraduate and I started out in technology. I was at Microsoft um, back it makes me feel very old, but it was back when we were just introducing Windows. And I was a product manager helping think about what features and functions uh, people would like to see in a word processor. I was a Microsoft Word product manager and, and then was on the founding team of Microsoft Office. And uh, went to business school at Harvard and came back to Silicon Valley and was one of the very first employees at Yahoo, which was really fun. It was before we had a sign on the door. Um, we were about 30 people and literally we were so crammed into one little room that the guy whose cubicle was next to mine, I had to share a trash can with him because he couldn't get in and out of the cubicles if he didn't. Um, and, uh, and, and really, it was a, such a fun time because... You know, we didn't have any idea how people were going to use the internet, and uh, we were just sort of making it up as we went along. and And it was very entrepreneurial. Um, and, and I was responsible for a bunch of the business development side, so the business side of a, of a bunch of products, putting mail and search and and Yahoo Finance and so forth. And then, so one of my favorite projects at Yahoo was that I was one of the only women, and I was convinced. I said, "Wouldn't it be cool if you could shop online?" And the guys are like, no, <laughs> shopping's not fun. Why would we want to shop online? It's, the internet's for stock quotes and sports scores and pornography. And, and I thought, you know, but shopping for shoes is a little bit like pornography for women, right? Like we don't actually have to buy them, but we enjoy the shopping process. We enjoy browsing and looking and that turns pages. And um, they were not convinced. So I went out and bought HTML for dummies and literally wrote a, Yahoo shopping page. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that was kind of one of my, my claim to fame. I obviously eventually did get their attention and, and, and there was an entire you know, team that was responsible for Yahoo shopping. And of course, e-commerce turned out to be about two thirds of the company's revenue. So <laughs> I turned out to be right, but, uh, but it was really fun. So I really loved my Yahoo days. But the thing was that, you know, by the time I got to be like 3000 employees, um, it just felt so bureaucratic. And, and part of, you know, being young in your career is, is having self-awareness about where you fit in, you know, sort of the company's life cycle. And, and I realized very early that, you know, I'm not the idea person, but I'm the person who can grab an idea and say, ah, I know how to do that, right? And could make something happen. But then when it gets to be professionalized and it's 3,000 people and it's much more about, you know, business planning and, you know, it, it just, it's no longer interesting to me. So I left Yahoo and, um, and stepped up to be the CEO of a publicly traded company that was based in Canada that um, was an investment firm that owned, it was kind of a mess actually. It owned like 12 different businesses, minority positions in 12 businesses, and it shouldn't have been publicly traded. So it was a really fun project where we sold 10 of the 12 assets, took that money and bought in the remaining shares and privatized it, um, and then sold the company. So basically, I, I shut down a public company, <laughs> just kind of a fun exercise. Um, but, then, uh, but then when I left, you know, I started thinking about what I was going to do next, and I wanted to go back into technology. I thought I was going to come back to Silicon Valley and get involved in another tech startup. Uh, but as most people do when they're in kind of career hiatus, they, you know, I thought, well, while I'm taking a little time to think about what I want to do next, maybe I'll get involved in something impactful and something philanthropic. And, and I really thought about it as philanthropy. And, and I, as I was looking around, the thing that really caught my attention was microfinance. I loved the idea of, you know, helping people build their own way out of poverty. And having been from Silicon Valley, seeing the power of entrepreneurship and how incredible and how passionate people can be when they, you know, are running their own business. I really, you know, was smitten by the idea of taking that to developing countries. So 
I got involved in microfinance um, philanthropically. I figured that I would just be supporting, you know, some organizations and and uh, and and was introduced to Muhammad Yunus, who's sort of the founder of microfinance, and and um, I was invited to to potentially join the board of Grameen Bank. So I went as an observer to a board meeting, and as I'm looking at at what I'm hearing, and I'm thinking, wait, but this is profitable. And, and as I looked at the microfinance industry, the vast majority of microfinance organizations were 2,000 borrowers or fewer. They were tiny, no economies of scale, no professional management. And because of that, they had to charge really high interest rates. But the big ones, and there were very few, had economies of scale and could actually afford to, 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 to charge a lower interest rate. They, you know, the, so, so I started thinking, like, why are we doing this nonprofit dollars, right? Like, if I could get a donation of $100, but I might get a million dollars if I could tell the investor that they were going to get their money back with some sort of a return. And Muhammad Yunus looked at me and he said, it's unethical to make money while doing good. And, and I kind of understand where he was coming from, which is, you know, if, you're, if you are a, you know, an investor and you're trying to maximize returns, you know, that could be conflicting with the goals of impact. But it was really a pivotal moment for me where I struggled with that. And I thought that if I can help more people faster and charge them a lower interest rate, I'm actually okay with my ethics on that, right? Like I, 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 and, and then Steve Rockefeller pulled me aside at the lunch break and he's like, don't worry so much about the ethics. It's just not possible. And, and I walked out of there thinking, you know what? I know I'm right. I just know it. And so just to prove the concept, I raised a little $10 million fund, friends and family, um, called the Dignity Fund. This was way before the concept of impact investing had even been coined. But I just knew that if we could put for-profit dollars into these microfinance organizations, they could get really big and 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 ideally, you know, charge lower interest rates and help more people and, and help them better. And so so I started the Dignity Fund. Most people thought I was crazy. And even my investors were like, wait, but why am I getting my money back? Microfinance is charity. I must supposed to get my money back. Uh, so it was really an education process. But um, but we it, you know we invested in fourteen organizations in twelve countries and um, got a nice little return for our investors six and a half percent IRR. Uh, but you know the most important thing was I didn't I knew I wasn't going to be the one that was going to you know solve you know, poverty in, in, in the world, but it was trying to be a demonstration effect. And so one of the important things I did is I, I got HSBC, Deutsche Bank, Citibank to all sit on my investment committee meetings. And because the point was to prove to them that they should be doing this. And Deutsche Bank went on very shortly thereafter and raised an $85 million fund in microfinance that I was on that board. And and now the vast majority today, the vast majority of money that goes into microfinance is for profit. And the microfinance industry is largely credited for, I mean, we've, we've more or less eradicated what the UN would call extreme poverty in the world. And microfinance has been a big part of that. So, um, so it was, it was really exciting. And I have to say, I got so smitten by this idea of, of the fact that you can do good w while investing. Um, and that, that even charitable causes, if they can find a for-profit model can scale so much, you know, quicker and more powerfully. And, and so, I never found the day job. Let's just say that. <laughs> I, I, uh, since that time, I've been involved in impact investing, which is now not just you know an, an, an elusive term, but is really an entire industry. Um, I've been involved in impact investing since then. So that was 2004. Um, been involved in a number of funds. I've been um, on the investment committee of a fund of funds. I've done, I've raised a number of funds and, and, um, and really feel passionately about the idea that you know, investing with your values is both great for the investor, but also, you know, is going to, is going to help scale the, the solutions to the world's problems. And I, you know, I, I, I always say if, if, you know, if somebody can get rich solving this world's problem, the problem will get solved and, you know, harnessing the power of capitalism or to be blunt, you could call it greed, but, but it's, but it's a powerful force and we need to harness it and put it in the right direction. And that's how we're going to solve, you know, the really big problems, not with philanthropy. So do you still have a Yahoo email? I do. I'm Elizabeth at Yahoo.com. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that in the show notes. So be prepared for even more spam. <laughs> so where's all the misinformation in the whole impact investment arena? Yeah. So, um, so first of all, impact investing uh, has now been around for about 20 years. And I think that people have this conception when they first get into impact investing. Well, first, the biggest one is 
is there's a lot of um, confusion between impact investing and ESG. And so ESG... ESG for our audience, what does it stand for? That's environmental, social, and governance. And and it is a filter that is typically applied to uh, public companies and public company investing that can... Basically, the idea is that that there is more to a company's both risks and opportunities than are captured on the balance sheet and income statement. And so if you're evaluating investing in a company, you need to look at more than just the financial aspects. And um, ESG has really taken off. I think it's a very, very powerful you know, movement, let's call it, right? And, and honestly, but ESG investing is, is the goal is to maximize your financial returns and to make more informed financial investment decisions in companies that are not impactful. They're, they're you know, the general companies in the world, but making more informed investments. And um, that's very different from impact investing. So impact investing is investing specifically in companies whose product or service is going to make a positive impact in the world. And that tends to be private companies. They tend to be um, generally small, but you know, more and more really growing. And I think, you know, some of the misconceptions about impact investing, the first is that that, you know, by investing my portfolio in ESG, I'm doing impact investing. Right. So, so they're very different. The other one is that um, you know, that that you know, there's a big conception that impact investing is what are we hearing now? Hearing the train again. The train. <laughs> How many trains are there in Pal or in Menlo Park? Russian trains. We didn't have trains before. <laughs> <laughs> I used to ride the train down to Yahoo. I was working and I lived in San Francisco and took the train down to Yahoo. So yeah, it runs every 20 or 30 minutes. I still like how <laughs> your email address is your first name, Yahoo. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's because um, I was actually a friend of mine from business school who came to me and gave me this pitch and said, wouldn't it be cool if you could, you know, he, he had this company that had, you could be your name at superwoman.com or your name at coffee.com or whatever. And he said, wouldn't it be cool if you could be your name at yahoo.com? And I said, no, why does anybody want to like brand associate themselves with their search engine? Right. Like I was like, oh, I don't see it. So I, I threw him out and, and, and sent him out nicely. And, 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 but as I was thinking about it later, I thought, well, I mean, there's no harm in offering it. I don't know if anybody's going to do it, but right, we already own the domain and whatever. And so I sent this email to, I forwarded his email to uh, some of my team. And I said, you know, this guy's got this idea. You could be, you know, use Yahoo domain as an email address. And, and I said, it's kind of a good idea. Maybe we should try it, but there's no reason we need to do it with him just because he's some guy I vaguely knew at business school. The problem was I'd replied to the email and not forwarded it. <laughs> So <laughs> you guys so, stayed friends after So he that. sent me a note back and he said, I see how you feel about our friendship at business school. <laughs> and, and, and also you're right. You don't need me. And, um, and so, you know, I don't know that we really thought it was going to be a big, a big thing, but it was just in those Yahoo days. <laughs> so we that was the first experimenting with things. The first guy to get his heart crushed over email. <laughs> 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 yep. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it was actually fun at Yahoo to be, because I was business development, so I was on the receiving end of these ideas, right? So some some older gentleman came in and said, did you know that all of the data about flights is public information, where, from, and to, and the prices? And he said, wouldn't it be cool if Yahoo built like a front page where you could pick where you're going from and where you're going to and and see prices? And he said, my daughter is working from home these days because she's got two children and she could print the tickets back then you printed them and we'd have the Yahoo logo on it and we'll share our $30 travel agent fee with you 50, 50. And I said, okay. So we wrote this little front end and the first quarter, he sent me quarterly revenue share, you know, invoices or whatever. And, and the first quarter was about $2,000 <laughs> and, and the next quarter was about $6,000. I thought this thing's not working. And literally, it's just about timing and guessing, right? And so, obviously, online travel took off. And, a, and a, about six months later, these guys came in, Travelocity, and they said, our investors are willing to invest on the condition that we can buy out the travel contract that with Yahoo. I thought about it. I thought, I don't think I signed a contract with that guy. <laughs> we were really just kind of winging it. 
Oh man. Okay, let's go back to let's the whole ESG Now that the train has gone, yes. I'm going to somehow slice that into this interview, just to let you know. <laughs> especially my witty remark. <laughs> what should we know about impact focus companies? So impact companies are, um, are very different in the sense that, that they've got two missions, right? They're trying to, trying to, to grow and, and make money for their investors, but they're also trying to do good. And so um, it is... Um, it, it takes a lot more vigilance in terms of the board and the management to be very, very clear about what the company's objectives are. And I think that because those two objectives are sometimes um, in conflict, it's super important that the company is clear upfront about what they are trying to accomplish and have really clear agreement with the board and with investors, quite frankly, about, you know, are we trying to maximize impact or maximize our returns or somewhere in between and be sure that we've agreed on, on those lines. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, with impact companies, you'll often have founders who come at it uh, because for almost philanthropic reasons, they have a philanthropic goal, but they have realized that being a profit structured company is going to help them scale. And then you have companies on the other side where the founder is trying to maximize revenue and return and has realized that if it's got a nice little impact veneer on it, that that's going to, you know, maybe attract investors. And so, um, and, and there's everything in between. And so being very, very clear about what the company's mission is and agreeing on that in advance is super important. And your first fund, the micro lending fund, how did you go about measuring the impact of it other than you said 6% return. How did you manage to put metrics or that around this helped this many people, this did that? Yeah, it's fun because, um, you know, back then there was not all the infrastructure there is today. There, there are great impact measurement tools and, and standards and so forth, but back then there weren't. And so, um, so generally what our, uh, portfolio companies did was, most they would look at, at very easy to measure things because the uh, the loan officers were going out to the villages and making these loans, and they would you know be asked to collect data, but you couldn't make that too onerous. And so, um, you know, generally you, it was actually really interesting. It was whether the the borrower at the beginning of the loan had a solid floor under the house because if it's dirt, there tends to be more disease and so forth. And what percent of their kids are in school, and particularly girls. And then at the end of the loan, checking back in on the, that data, because, you know, having your kids in school is, is actually, unfortunately, in extreme poverty is a real luxury that we would always be asked, like, what percent of your borrowers you brought up across the poverty line, as if this is like some line in the sand and people walk across it, right? Um, they're, you know, they, they don't necessarily measure their income in, in dollars or, or pesos, right? They have trading flour for, you know, for transportation and, and all that. And so it's just really hard to measure. So we would come up with sort of these more unique measurements that, that assured us that, you know, what we were doing was making an impact and changing lives. And you touched on it at the beginning, but can you dive a little bit deeper of why micro and what motivated you to do that? So when I was looking into, um, you know, the microfinance world, I went on a, on a trip to go see microfinance in action and in India. And I, I met a mother, a single mother who had a cow and had three children and she would sell the cow's milk, but it was not enough money to feed all three children. And she, every night she had to look in the eyes of one of them and say, I'm sorry, you know, to decide which children were going to eat and which ones weren't. And, and she had just decided that it was so painful that she was going to save her extra pennies and save up for poison so that she could kill herself and them and end everybody's misery. And at that point, she was introduced to this microfinance bank that lent her $400. And for $400, she was able to buy a thermometer that could pasteurize the milk into cheese, which sells for obviously a whole lot more. And by the time I got there, I met her and heard her story. And she had all three kids after school, and they were in school, biking to the other villages, selling, selling her cheese, and, uh, and had really you know, made it out of her desperation for $400. And then I just became hooked on this, on this idea and this concept that you know, people can build their own way out of poverty. And, and I named it the Dignity Fund because it really is about dignity. 
you know, people don't want handouts. They want to build their own solutions, but they need, you know, they need access. They need help. They need, they need, you know, they, they're not allowed to go into banks. You know, they're people with guards, you know, they're guards with machine guns to keep people like them out. Right. Um, and so, you know, building inclusive financial systems is, is just so important. And, um, and, and I've just seen the power of it. So, I, I loved it and fell in love with it. And, and I feel like microfinance is one of the many tools that, that we have in our arsenal to, to really make a big dent in, in, in poverty and suffering. So where do you think there's the greatest opportunity in micro lending? So opportunity for the future. I mean, the industry has evolved so much now that it's really professionalized and scaled. I think that, um, well, first of all, loans are one tool for financial inclusion for the poor but they're not necessarily the most important or the right one for a lot of people, right? And so the other thing that that is really missing in a lot of these developing countries is 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 a vehicle for savings. You know, if you make your money and you stick it under your mattress and then, you know, quite frankly, I hate to say it, but a lot of our borrowers are women. And so your husband comes home and he knows where it is and he takes it and he goes and drinks it, right? And so savings um, is a really huge and important thing. And it's it's tricky because, you know, a lot of these countries don't have the equivalent of an FDIC. And so um, it's very hard to allow these microfinance banks to take savings. But um, but the ones that have figured out how to do that regulatory-wise is, is really valuable. Um, there's also a huge need for insurance. You find that the poor, um, you know, save disproportionately because they have to, because they're so worried that if a child gets sick and they have to use the money to buy medicine that, you know, it's going to throw off the entire family's economic system. And so um, the lack of insurance is, um, is causing people to not invest all the money that they have in what they're doing. And so, um, and so micro insurance is super important. Um, but then, you know, there are lots of opportunities now. I mean, the old model of microfinance was, you know, a loan officer would bike out to a village once a week and they'd have a little ceremony and everybody would get up and repay, you know, their loan in front of each other. But, but now with digital banking and, and cell phones and so forth, you know, the big opportunity is to be able to really reduce costs in the system and therefore, of course, reduce the interest rate um, with, uh, with mobile banking. And your next fund, it was in Latin America, it was multiple countries. How much more difficult was that to do something so geographically spread out versus just one isolated area? Well, actually, it's kind of the other way around, which was that in microfinance, we were picking one topic, which is microfinance. So really specializing and understanding, you know, how to how to do due diligence and, and how to select microfinance and organizations, but it was across 14 countries. So, you, so I've kind of learned that you pick one topic and you do you can do it globally, or you pick a specific country or specific region and you can do more topics, right? So, so, um, so our my Latin America fund is that the expertise is in working in those countries, but that allows us to do you know different theses and different types of companies. So in Latin America, we are in we are in lots of countries. We're in Nicaragua, Honduras, Panama, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Peru. Uh, but we are investing in different sectors. We're doing uh, investing a lot in low income housing. Um, sustainable agriculture companies are are really important to buy products from poor farmers because the world's extreme poverty seems to be disproportionately in rural and, and, and farmers. Um, and so, you know, we can, we can cover a couple different topics in, you know, be, but Latin America also is kind of funny. It's almost like the United States and they're each different States, you know, I mean, they're so similar, especially those smaller com countries. And so you really can kind of develop expertise in the region. And, uh, but if we were going to do big, big, countries. And we have talked about doing like a Brazil specific fund or Mexico specific fund. Those would need to be country specific because, you know, you really need to develop the expertise in learning about the, you know, obviously the government and the regulations, but also, you know, the cultures are different and the, the, the way the business world operates is so different. I lived in Costa Rica for almost two years. So one of these days we got to get drinks and share some stories, but I got a question for you on, you've been to all these emerging countries. Other than just straight money, what else is lacking in that entrepreneur business community? What what would help them other than just a, you know dollars and cents? Well, what you've hit on is the entrepreneur community because these countries don't have the entrepreneurial ecosystem and, quite frankly, cultural ethos 
for entrepreneurship. You know, here in Silicon Valley, we're so spoiled and, and, and entrepreneurship is almost taken for granted. And, and there's, of course, the whole ecosystem of the venture capitalists, but there's support systems and, and networks and education and, and, you know, there are lawyers who know how to deal with entrepreneurs. And, and, you know, there's an entire business ecosystem that does not exist in developing countries. And being an entrepreneur in a developing country, you're kind of on your own. And so, um, you know, there aren't venture capital funds for the most part down there. I mean, we're coming in from, you know, from, from the U S um, and there's not all of the support systems that have been so important here in Silicon Valley. So it's what much more challenging to be an entrepreneur in, in those developing countries. When you were going out and raising this money for the fund to help, what were the conversations like? What was it to the LPs, to the people writing you the check that you were saying, discussing to get them involved, get them wanting to do this? Well, impact investors tend to come at investing very differently than than traditional investors who are looking to maximize returns. So generally, the impact investors, are they care about this topic, they care about the change that the impact is going to make. And that is first and foremost, and, it's, and, and the returns expectations are secondary. Some, you know, impact investing is not all one flavor. There are some that are specifically impact first that are trying to accomplish the impact um, and that using a financial model seems to be the sharpest tool to accomplish the impact. That was certainly what it was in microfinance. In microfinance, you know, I wanted to expand the microfinance industry. The goal was to get more loans to poor people. And if I could do that best with philanthropy, I would have used philanthropy. But I believe that the sharpest tool was for-profit investing. And so but it was very clear with investors, our goal here is to expand microfinance and your investment will help us do that, but we're not maximizing that. Then you also have impact investment funds that are really trying to maximize returns and therefore may make different trade-offs. And so I think the other thing that's really important is having very clear conversations with investors about where you are on the spectrum between you know con concessionary returns or, or profit maximization and making sure that you're aligned because every time I'm in a boardroom, right? So as an example, you, I'm in a boardroom with a company that's buying, um, you know, mangoes from poor farmers, right? So if I'm trying to profit maximize, I want to pay as little as possible. And if I'm trying to help poverty alleviation, I want to pay as much as possible, right? And so being aligned and having investors understand from the beginning, you know, where we are on that spectrum as a fund, um, is super important. And generally with impact investors, they are more interested in the impact and the returns are secondary. We're especially finding that as the younger generations are starting to control the funds, they really want to make an impact with their money and they're not really so concerned about maximizing the returns. And that allows, you know, impact funds to make different decisions about how risky or how concessionary the investments are that they make. But what about the board, a board that is composed for one of these impact funds? What are the conversations like there? Are those people that are on the board, are they especially niched in the nonprofit sector, their background? I'm kind of curious about the composition of an impact investment board. Sure. Well, so generally we want to have people that have industry expertise in the topic, right? And so, you know, if we've got a food company, I want to have people who are from the food industry, generally uh, folks that have corporate experience, because the other thing about, you know, you know, impact focused companies, they, and I'm speaking primarily about, you know, in developing countries, they don't have, they haven't had the expertise of how to build a company. And so they generally don't have professional governance structures. They don't have reporting structures. And so one of the things that I think we bring as board members is to help them professionalize their organization and bring, and bring that sort of more corporate type thinking. And so, um, and so generally, you know, the, the boards tend to be, you know, coming from the profit world, from the for-profit world. Um, and and hopefully have industry sector expertise, but you know those board meetings are always again if we've done our job and we've and we've agreed in advance, you know where we are on the spectrum of between impact focused and and returns focused. Um, you know we we tend to hold each other accountable, right? And so making those trade offs and those decisions are um, very tangible. It's very you know transparent that we are making the decisions that we are, which is to, you know, maybe we're not going to profit maximize. Maybe we really want to, you know, do this, you know, do this a different way where it's going to, you know, help the poor farmers, or we're going to be able to build more housing, even if it, you know, it's going to minimize our returns. And so, um, you know, the, 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 
they're obviously very interesting conversations when you've got two different goals that you're that you're trying to balance. Could you dive deeper into that? The questions that the board will ask themselves, because that, that's very interesting. It's you know, for profit or, or I mean, to make money or to do good. How do they go about the decision? How are, how are those internal conversations? Generally, most of you know, the, the folks who are investing in impact investing funds are interested in seeing the impact and that is their biggest priority. And so um, generally, it, it you know, we look at any corporate decision through the lens of what is going to allow us to make bigger impact. And obviously growing our bottom line is going to allow the company to make bigger impact. And so, um, so the, you know, the, the, the internal conversations are, are really around if we, if we can uh, do more with this company and grow this company, whatever it is, whether it's building low income housing as an example, and we want to, you know, want to do more of that. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, making sure that we're all still prioritizing the reason that we're there. And, and the nice thing is that, you know, a lot of the money is coming in from either foundations or family offices that have specifically designated, we want to see this good happen. And so, you know, that's sort of a guiding principle from our fiduciary responsibility is to, uh, is to follow what, you know, what the investors are wishing for. The companies that you invest in, are they pretty much siloed or do they do joint partnerships with each other? Do they work together? Uh, to, to better, to bring everyone up? So uh, with my current fund in Latin America, I've seen a lot of interesting collaboration. In fact, we've done one company that we created ourselves that was specifically a collaboration of a number of our businesses. So we have our chocolate company in Costa Rica that is providing the, we're making a, a, a well, we, we have a company called Candid Snacks that is um, a, you know, snacking cacao you know, health food snack. And, and it's got mangoes from our company in Nicaragua and it's got quinoa from our company in Peru and it's got the cacao from our company in Costa Rica. And so that is literally a collaboration between our, our investment companies. But, uh, but more, at, but, but, you know, aside from that, there's a lot of interesting, important collaborations. It's why we tend to focus on specific industries. We, you know, in this fund, we've got two or three specific industries like housing where they help us with our deal flow because the folks in the housing industry know other people who are doing similar stuff. Right. And so we get, uh, we get interesting investment pipelines, but they also can share knowledge. And, and we've seen a lot of knowledge sharing, like for instance, in our um, agricultural portfolio about, you know, how to work with poor farmers, which, you know, is, is expensive and tricky, uh, but really mission aligned. And so, you know, we've got, we have knowledge sharing from our company in, in Nicaragua, that's, just doing awesome. That's doing mangoes and, and dragon fruit and so forth. And so that knowledge sharing gets shared back and, and largely that knowledge sharing happens because of what we do as a fund. So we have um, impact, you know, managers that work for us that go around between our various portfolios and consult and help them, you know, figure out their processes and figure out things. And they can say, well, this is what the guys in Nicaragua are doing about that problem. So, uh, so the knowledge sharing is really helpful. With all these companies you've mentioned, there's probably one that has some story that really hits you that that you could share with us. Uh, well, I mean, I feel like they're all like my babies. It's hard to hard to say like which of your child children is your favorite, but um, but one that I that I will call out is a company that is based in Ecuador, but it's 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 in both Ecuador and Peru, and it's got a female CEO, which is very rare, and they grow hot chili pepper hot chilies from about. 700 farmers in Ecuador and Peru, and they have really specialty chilies like ghost chilies and scorpion and, and so forth that they buy from these small farmers and they mash them or dry them and, and sell them in the North American markets to, to Tabasco and other hot sauce companies. And uh, obviously the farmers are getting you know, two or three times for their peppers, what they would get if they were trying to sell them on the local market. But um, it's been a fun example because, you know, it's this company that didn't have a board. They didn't really have professional systems in place. And so, um, you know, it's near and dear to my heart because as investors, we, we came in, we we're obviously the first professional money in and could really help them shape their, their corporate structures and, and really help them grow. And, um, and now they're, they're really poised for success and they're growing like crazy and, and the hot specialty chili pepper market, I knew nothing about, but, um, but it's actually just really fun to see how, first of all, hot peppers are really growing in the market. It's like a, you know, it's very trendy right now. And so we're kind of at the right place at the right time. And speaking of kind of the trajectory of the market, where do you see ESG investing in that 
say five years from now? Well, ESG investing, there's not going to be anything other than ESG investing. And, and, and honestly, I think that if you're an investor, even if you have, you're not looking at it from an ethics or, or impact standpoint at all, you're just trying to maximize your portfolio. You're ridiculous if you're not looking at ESG factors because they are going to be so important to, to evaluating investments in companies, whether they are, you know, there's going to be a regulatory risk. Certainly, certainly you're seeing that, you know, as the millennials start to move in that are controlling more of the investment funds, but also controlling more of the purchasing decisions, they are demanding that companies are environmentally responsible and that they are, you know, socially responsible and that they're diverse boards and all the rest. And so um, I think that, that uh, companies, first of all, we also know there have been thousands of studies that have shown that that investment funds that that are using ESG as filters are outperforming those that don't. And so um, this is not really about investors, you know, having you know impact focus. This is about you know even just investors that are trying to maximize their returns are you know are missing out if they're not looking through ESG factors. So I really believe that that there's not going to be a difference between ESG investing and and traditional investing. I think all investing is going to be looking at those ESG factors. I also believe that there's going to be a lot more pressure to be uh, for companies to be thinking about their ESG aspects and and largely because not only do studies show that those companies outperform but companies with diverse boards outperform that that you know millennials are willing to pay more for products that are that are you know have been you know, produced with environmental and and social um, goals you'll see that uh, millennials are more likely to return gifts that that they don't see that are from companies that they don't believe are are you know ESG responsible um, I actually I saw an interesting study from McKinsey that uh, in the M and A space that said that that um, potential acquirers when they're looking at companies to acquire are willing you know something like twenty five percent of them were willing to pay a premium for a company twenty to fifty percent for a company that was you know that they thought was ESG responsible and so you know it's it's fundamental business sense at this point and um, so I, I really think that it's you know it's it's I to say ESG is going to grow is kind of silly it's sort of like it, it's just going to be like it's going to be the thing that, it, that that folks are doing in their investment decisions now impact investing is also really um, moved forward in the last twenty years and and you know it's no longer just you know it used to be kind of more like angel investing and these cute little companies these little social enterprises and um, and now you know there are professional funds that are investing in impact. And these funds are second and third and even fourth generation, right? So you're starting to see track records and and they're they're big funds and they know what they're doing. And so um, and so the impact investing side is, you know, is really matured and it's and it's and it's grown quickly. And I think it's gonna be, you know, really kind of its own asset class that 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 folks will invest in with different thinking than they would invest in a venture capital fund in Silicon Valley. But um, but I think that 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 different thinking is is you know it's where particularly in the millennials who are taking over a lot more of the money and uh in the investment world you know that's what they're prioritized and i want to ask earlier you focused on nonprofits, but from my understanding your current venture is a for-profit why why the switch there what's your thoughts of nonprofit versus profits well yeah, actually, the other way around. Oh. So, <laughs> so I have spent the we'll last edit that part out. It's okay. <laughs> so yes, I've spent the last twenty years um, trying to figure out, starting with microfinance, helping organizations that might have been nonprofits think about how to find sustainable business models and to be able to take for profit investment dollars, and have been you know really kind of the, the you know preaching for this idea of of um, you know finding sustainable ways and business models for, you know, for pro projects that are social good and that, you know, let people make money while doing good and then the problems will get solved. So it's a little ironic that during the pandemic, obviously I, I made the decision that we, we had finished our, uh, investing our fund one in Latin America and we finished fund investing fund two. We were getting ready to raise fund three when the pandemic hit and no investors were investing in anything at that point. Uh, and so we decided to pause the fundraising for, of course, what we thought was going to be a month or so <laughs> pandemic. Um, and, uh, and, and I started thinking about what I could do in the meantime. And, and, and I was looking for what I would think of as a project and, and started looking around home. And I just felt like, you know, this homelessness problem here in California is killing me. It's so unacceptable. 
And so I, I went into it with a, you know, a naive, you know, frame, right. And, and knowing very little about homelessness, but started to study it. And, um, and, and the thing that gets me every time is when I look at an industry and a situation and there's one gaping hole that people aren't seeing. And then I'm like, oh man, <laughs> I'm going to have to do this. <laughs> but, but in, in the homelessness world, I, I, I took a look at it and I felt like, so in California, we're spending all of our money on permanent housing with these huge budgets and we put them all into building permanent housing. And the result is that 72% of our homeless are unsheltered and they're on these waiting lists. And we're not, we don't have a good strategy for that 72%. We, we put them in these big rooms with bunk beds and people didn't want to go to those before. And they definitely don't want to go to those now. And you, you know, we, we hadn't really thought about how to, and, and so therefore they don't come, right? So these big shelters and they're half empty. And so cities say, we don't need more shelters. They're half empty. Well, of course they are. Um, and so, you know, it just seems so obvious that what, what we need is, is interim housing, places where people can come immediately. That's really inexpensive, but where everybody has their own room. And if they can have their own space, they can have a door that locks, they have the dignity of that, then, then they can get out of survival mode and start to work on the problems. And so, um, and so we started talking about, you know, we started talking to manufacturers and, you know, whether we could build something that could be really fast, prefabricated. And, um, and so we, we've, we've come up with this model that they're kind of like high end Ikea, like there are these panels and you set them up and you can build these like kind of tiny home things for very, very little money. And so we've now, uh, officially started a 501c3. We have our 501c3 status. It's called Dignity Moves. I have a few employees and we are building, um, these interim housing projects across California. We've got one in San Francisco, one in Santa Barbara. Looks like we'll be doing one in Sonoma and Alameda, Santa Maria. So we are, uh, yeah, we're sort of trying to fill a really important hole in, in the, you know, the, the picture of addressing homelessness because, I feel like in California, it's just, it's, it's just absolutely unacceptable. We've got to be getting serious about getting people off the streets. So with that, are there laws and regulations changing that will help you out in this endeavor? Well, yes, the, the, a lot of things have, have aligned. So the first one is that, um, that California issued emergency building codes to allow us to build emergency housing that are not... The, the problem is that in, with permanent housing in California, it's costing like $850,000 per unit to build permanent housing, even if it's the affordable, you know, for the homeless. And it's largely because of the building codes. And so California has issued emergency building codes that allow us to build really inexpensive and really fast, but still safe. And, um, and so that's been one important piece of legislation that's, that's, that's really helped. There's another one that is, um, is really driving the demand is that there was a little known lawsuit that happened in uh, right before the pandemic, which is why I didn't get any attention, uh, where some homeless advocates in, in Idaho sued the city of Boise and said, you shouldn't be allowed to move people from encampments and, and enforce your anti-camping laws if, you, if they don't have a place to go. It shouldn't be illegal to do something that you can't avoid. And that went to the Supreme Court of Appeals and was upheld. And so that applies to California and all of the states in the Ninth Circuit. And so technically, cities are not allowed to break up encampments if they don't have enough shelter beds for people. And that's scaring a lot of these cities. So all of a sudden, they're thinking, wow, maybe we shouldn't just focus all of our money on permanent housing. That's going to take five years because we want the legal right to be able to move people. And, and um, it might not be for the right motivation, but it's still creating the right outcome, which is that, that cities are really interested in, in now thinking about you know, rapid housing and rapid solutions for the homelessness. And what lessons did you learn in your past I mean, from Yahoo to the funds that are helping you in this current endeavor. Well, so, the, you know, the first one is that, you know, in Yahoo, the, the, the rewinding even further, when I was at Microsoft, when we'd come up with a new product, you know, feature, you, we'd think about it and it would take 18 months because, you know, we'd release a new software release every 18 months. And so it was really, really slow feedback cycle. You'd put out a feature and then, you know, two years later, you'd find out whether people liked it or not. Right. And then with the Internet, you could literally put up a feature and 
generally what would happen with me is I would stay at work and sleep under my desk, <laughs> wake up the next morning or a couple times in the night to see whether people were using it and how it was being used. And so the feedback cycle was instant. And, um, and so that kind of, you know, throw something against the wall and see what sticks mentality is, is, um, has, has really carried with me, which is, you know, let's just experiment. Like we don't know exactly what the right solutions are, but let's try, right. Let's, let's throw something out there, do it really inexpensively where we're not investing a lot that you know is going to be irreversible, but um, but just try things, and so um, that I've definitely carried that into starting this this nonprofit. And then you know, as you can imagine, with my long history of of impact investing, you know, doing these first few projects philanthropically, but my brain is already going towards how we're going to set this up as an investment model. And um, and I and I do feel like the first couple of projects, proving ourselves, getting these built, and being able to walk people through them, you know, that's the right place for philanthropy. And then as with microfinance. The industry started with philanthropy, kind of get it going. But then once it's proven to be able to bring in investment dollars to really scale it. So that's, that's, that's where we're headed. And Elizabeth, if anyone wants to find out more about you, your current project, what's the best way to go about doing it? Well, um, my email is elizabeth at dignityfund.com. And my new Dignity Moves is dignitymoves.org, the homelessness initiative. And I've also got a website, dignitycapital.com, that kind of covers my my for-profit investing initiatives. Fantastic. We'll have all that information in the show notes. So for our listeners, please go to the Silicon Valley Podcast.com. Follow us on social media. Our handles, the Silicon Valley Podcast. And connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to find out what I do outside the podcast, where I'm a mid-market investment banker, focus on mergers, acquisitions, growth capital, and secondaries. And with that. Elizabeth, I want to thank you for your time today. And I want to thank Sapiens for hosting us. Thanks everyone from the Silicon Valley podcast. Thank you. Thank you.